Our next guest is a lifelong gardener who has learned some of life's most unexpected lessons while digging in the dirt. Mentors in the Garden of Life is a collection of touching stories about the people and the plants that have nurtured her while she's tilled the soil. Colleen Plimpton is a popular garden writer, lecturer, and coach, and joins us to talk about her unique gardening memoir. Welcome, Colleen. Thank you, Jocelyn. How did you grow this book, Mentor in the Garden of Life? It was a book that kind of just had to happen. I found as I entered middle age, there were so many gardening stories that I had to write down. Stories about people who had mentored me, taught me not only gardening, but life lessons. And they had to be commemorated somehow. So I put them together, a series of chapters, essays about people in my life, and some critters, too, that oh, I critters, met in the garden. Yes. <laughs> along with the plants that they helped me to grow. Well, people are like flowers and plants. We yeah. all come in different sizes, colors, and shapes. And so this makes sense, doesn't it? It certainly does. You have a chapter that uh, discusses your father, Sylvalen so so Plimpton, and a sugar maple tree. Yes. Yes. And it really, I, I read it, and you talk about this one specific day, and you were not very cooperative, and he was very frustrated with you on this day. Yes, he was. I was not an easy kid. It was the 60s, and I was testing the limits, and I decided that I was going to do what I could that day to get along with my dad. And there's a picture of your dad right there. Yes, my dad. We had a old ramshackle farmhouse with a bunch of acres that we lived on and dad was going to try and fix the garage. He enrolled me to help him that day and I found a sugar maple sapling that I had to have. My dad graciously stopped what he was doing. Is this the tree? That's very similar to very the tree. Very similar to Beautiful the tree. Beautiful colors. Okay. My dad stopped what he was doing and taught me how to transplant a tree how to transplant, how to move, how to care for baby tree. And I never forgot. I never forgot how to take care of a tree. I grow hundreds of trees now. <laughs> but I also never forgot the lesson that my dad taught me. Patience, responsibility, and love. How, well, how would you describe your relationship with your dad at that time? Contentious. Most of typical us. Typical for a 13-year-old? Typical. And I think many of us have been difficult teenagers at one, or we've known difficult teenagers in our lifetimes. And I was no exception. This was a healing moment. This was a, a time when I was able to sort of get beyond some of my own involvement and learn something about my father and about the land. So how did this change your relationship? I understood that my dad had something to teach me, that maybe he had something that I had not recognized yet. As I was pushing against the parental barriers, I realized that there were things that I could learn from him. Uh, is this when you discovered your passion for uh, becoming a gardener? The passion for becoming a gardener had probably always been there. Okay. I come from a long line of farmers and people who tilled the land. But that and many other incidents helped me to understand that this was my calling. You also have a chapter about your best friend, and I think her name is Muriel. Muriel. Ridner? Ridner, yes. Ridner, okay, and a pansy. Now, you describe her as a messy gardener. <laughs> Muriel, my best friend, is a messy gardener, but I love her nonetheless. And what I have learned from her is that there's many different ways of gardening. You don't have to be a neat-as-a-pin gardener. Things don't have to be in rows and color-coordinated. But uh, that is the way you are. And so it, it was somewhat at the very beginning, you really didn't appreciate that. No, I didn't. And that was something I learned from Muriel, that things can be scattered and overblown, and things can be in all kinds of array and color combinations. And you know what? The birds love that. The bumblebees love that. That's nature. And she taught me that, that one doesn't have to be controlled and buttoned down <laughs> in the garden, that you can be exuberant. All right, so how does the pansy come to play? The pansy. Muriel grows pansies in pretty pots on her patio. That's what I do. Oh, good. And then do you let them go to seed? Uh, I guess so. Okay. <laughs> I leave them there for a while. Oh, there you go. What happens with Muriel's pansies is that she leaves them there, they go to seed, and then next year 
the miracle happens. In the spring, little pansy plants of different colors pop up in the crevices of her patio, out in the lawn. You never know. I didn't know that that's what they happens. Will. They will self-sow. Okay. Oh, I love hearing that. All right. I will just leave my pansies alone Do as that. well. You have quite an award-winning garden yourself. What's in your garden? Oh, I grow probably a thousand different kinds of trees, shrubs, annuals, vines, perennials, vegetables. You name it, I've probably got it or have tried it. What's blooming right now? What's right now, oh, I brought along some pretty flowers. I picked them this morning. This is from, from your garden? It is. This, when I go out and lecture to garden clubs, I like to always pick a bouquet of what's blooming right now in my garden. So here we have several different kinds of And there's of a picture of your garden right now. Yes. This was my garden in the spring. My garden is very colorful. One of the things I emphasize is all season color. There should be something in bloom mm -hmm. at every juncture from March almost to Thanksgiving. What's the mistake most gardeners make when they create their garden? I think that the mistake is not starting with the soil. Mother Nature is abundant, but Mother Nature needs to have rich soil to grow things in. Things want to grow, but they've got to have a decent medium, and therefore composting is so important. So that's one of the things. And also, we gardeners kind of get overexcited. We plant too much, and we're not <laughs> able to take care of it all. Absolutely. Well, I, I love to garden. and. In the, in the spring, I love to put all kinds of plants out there, but then in the middle of it all, yes. I forget to water it as much as I should be watering. Yes, and this was a difficult year for water. Yes, oh. so my plants are wilting even as we speak. Yes, yes. The secret is to grow drought-tolerant plants, and mm -hmm. there's a whole host of them, and also, again, to have rich soil that holds the moisture. And what should people be looking at as the fall season comes to play here? What, should, what can they be planting? Oh, almost anything can be planted really? in the fall. Absolutely. Go to the nursery, find things that are in containers. But here's one thing I always advise gardeners. When you get something that's in bloom now, make sure that you purchase something that's going to bloom at a different season. If you get a fall blooming aster, go ahead and also get a spring blooming columbine. And if you do this every time you go to the nursery, pretty soon you too will have a garden that's colorful all season long. So basically you can plant now for the spring. Yes, you this can. is a good time to do this. Absolutely. What, yes. What roots want to grow. The soil is still warm. As the air cools, the roots continue to grow into the soil. So it's an excellent time to plant. Okay. And the name of the book again is Mentors in the Garden of Live Colleen Plimpton. Thanks so much for being here and for all that advice. You're very welcome. Coming up next, we're making a fresh corn chatter with mother-daughter cooking duo Betty Ann and Stephanie when Connecticut Style returns.